The BBC presents My Word. And here to introduce the programme and the panel is Jack Longland. My Word is a word game played by people whose business is words, and those taking part are Dennis Powell, Dennis Norden, Anne Scott James and Frank Muir. <laughs> and we go straight into round one, which tests their respective vocabularies. Two marks if they get the meaning of these words approximately right. Dennis Powell... What is a junta? J U N T A, junta. It's a collection of uh, political animals. It's frequently applied in a rather um, derogatory tone. That junta, they say. And what distinguishes them from other forms of government? Well, there are several of them, and they all um, are supposed to operate equally. Yes, I'm going to do. Um, two marks. It isn't, in fact, the original meaning of junta, which was, in Spain or Italy, simply a deliberative or administrative council. And it was another word, junto, with an O at the end instead of A, which was this other thing, a clique or a faction or cabal, uh, a political or other combination of persons. But um, the two words have got a bit confused together. A military junta has assumed authority. It's the sort of headline you see. Two marks. Dennis Norden. What is a vena? V I N A. Vena. Um, I have the faintest. These short words, it's very difficult to guess at. It, it <laughs> sounds like feminine wine. But <laughs> it's, a, it's a musical instrument. Yes, it's a musical your, instrument. Your partner is helping you. Yeah. It's sort of Good. filthy noise my daughter twangs away on. Yes, yeah, Guitar not... type, la type instrument. Yes, it is. A plucking Jolly instrument. Good. That'll do Good. Uh, one and a half. You haven't got it exactly. The vena is an Indian seven-stringed musical instrument which has a fretted finger fingerboard, I mean, that's very hard to say, and a gourd at each end, which I suppose is for resonance. And it is, in fact, a kind of Indian la, L-Y-R-E. And Scott James, what is a fingerling? Finger with L-I-N-G on the end. Well, those sort of things are usually fish, but... In yes, you have a, have a shot at the kind of fish you've got. You're all right so far. Well, a little fish... It gets very much bigger, Anne. Oh, a sort of big fish. No, no, no. No, <laughs> no Anne, Anne, it's a very little fish, but, but I'm trying to help you. It, it gets very, very much larger with luck later on. What's a big fish? Yeah, it could be a little form yes. A finger fish. It's a little finger fish. No, it's, it's something that you like. It's a fish finger. <laughs> <laughs> One out of two. <laughs> it is a very small fish, a very young fish. It's a par or young salmon. And at the stage in which it's that length, the length of a finger, it is called fingerling. It could also be a finger stall, but that's a long time ago, the 16th century. Frank Muir, what is a rubber dub? Eh, yeah, uh, it's an onomatopoeic word. Yes. Like to enter R. Yes, very like that. With to enter R is to do with the, the military. Rubber dub dub is to do with fairgrounds. Now, how about that for a baffling answer? It's quite good, but what instrument would it be onomatopoeic it's, it's about? It's onomatopoeically representative of the sound of a drum. Yep. <laughs> Where's to enter R is the drum for by the left quick march. <laughs> Rubber dub is a kind of uh, fairground barker's drum yes, called do. the Merry Andrews. It is, in fact. Uh, a noun which imitates the sound, the rolling sound of a drum, rubber dub dub, and the verb is to make a noise like a drum. The French do it differently as they usually do. They don't call it rubber dub dub; they call it rataplan. But perhaps French drums are quite different. Two marks. Before we start round two, I give each team a quotation, and Dillis Bow and Frank Muir, your quotation is anyone for tennis. And Anne Scott James and Dennis, yours is here today, gone tomorrow. And at the end of the program, I shall ask Dennis and Frank to give me their idea of how these came to be said or written. Round two is a round of moon questions. Two marks again. Dennis Powell, what is a moon calf? C-A-L-F, a moon calf. Well, I thought it was rather a 
a, a stupid youngish character. Yes, that's the um, figurative um, way in which the thing's used, but it did mean something very much more material, I think very unpleasantly material, before that. Um, more material. Was it a uh, kind of horror thing? Yes. Uh, as a calf uh, born with propensities for evil in some way? Oh. Well, he might be born with four heads or something like that. Oh, in other words, a oh. monster? Yes. Oh, I settle for that. Yes, I think between you, you get your two marks. Um, moon calf originally in the 16th century was an inanimate, shapeless abortion, and it was supposed to have been produced prematurely by a cow because of the evil influence of the moon, which happened to be in the wrong quarter at that time. But then afterwards it became used to indicate somebody who was really a born fool. But if you look at Shakespeare's Tempest, you find after the storm that poor old Trinculo says, I hid me under the dead moon calf's gabardine for fear of the storm. He'd been lying up alongside Caliban, who was one such monster. Two marks. Dense Norden, what is a moonlight flit? <laughs> I think it's best illustrated in the verse of a musical song. It's one of the best written verses ever. It's, we had to move away, the rent we couldn't pay, the moving van came round just after dark. There was me and my old man packing things inside the van, which we'd often done before, let me remark. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely right, Dennis. You've got the whole of it in that, those verses. A moonlight flit is a clandestine removal of yourself and your furniture during the night in order to avoid paying your rent and at the same time getting away with your furniture so that the furniture isn't seized in place of your having paid your rent. That's a moonlight flit or flitting. Two marks. And Scott James... What are or were known as Moon's Men? Moon's Men. Well, it was sort of early astronauts. No, it's chaps who operate in the dark, which makes it easier. Well, smugglers or...? Yes, they're getting now. Surgeons in a blackout. <laughs> <laughs> Highwaymen, perhaps. Yes. Oh. No, that's what I want. Yes. Highwaymen. Um, two marks it is. Moon's Men were thieves and highwaymen who applied their trade by night. It could be, I think, be smugglers as well. Sometimes it's used of gypsies. And uh, in Henry IV, part one this time, I think, Prince Henry says to Falstaff, um, the fortune of us that are the moon's men doth ebb and flow like the sea. It's a dangerous trade. Two marks. Frank Muir, you have found an elephant in the moon. You are balmy. <laughs> <laughs> Yes, that's just about it. Do you remember its origin at all? No. <laughs> I don't remember because I never heard it before. <laughs> Have you a, a likely yarn mm -hmm. to recount to us, Jack? One and a half, I think. It means the whole thing is a mare's nest, completely true and unfounded, and it has a rather odd origin. In the 17th century, a chap called Sir Paul Neal, who was a conceited type, gave out that he had discovered an elephant on the moon. And what in fact happened was that a mouse had crept into his telescope while he was observing <laughs> the moon. He'd mistaken it for an elephant on the moon. And Samuel Butler, number one, whom Frank knows well, wrote a hysterical poem about it and him called The Elephant in the Moon. Well, now a round of who, why, what and where questions. Two marks again. Lillis Powell, what is the most dangerous variety of snark and why? A boojum. Now, why? Well, um, didn't it make it disappear? Yes. Made it disappear? Made you disappear. <laughs> oh, well, I'll give you a two marks. Somebody disappeared. That's right. Uh, a snark, well, a snark was a chimerical creature of rather ill-defined characteristics and potentialities, which is only to be found in Lewis Carroll's poem, The Hunting of the Snark. But the most dangerous variety of all was the boojum, because anybody who sighted it would softly and silently vanish away. And that's the last line of... Uh, fit eight at the end of the poem, for the snark was a boojum, you see, so the chap disappeared. Two marks. Dennis Norton, very different. What is a Watteau bodice? W-A-T-T-E-A-U, Watteau bodice. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm resisting the... Uh, <laughs> of saying looking down at a bodice and saying, what-ho? <laughs> <laughs> Shh! 
she bumps. <laughs> I can only take it that it's, it's a, some kind of, of uh, fashion of bodies as painted by the painter Watteau, yes. or Watteau, <laughs> yes. as they call him. It was. Now, you wouldn't like to sketch it. You would like me to go into this. <laughs> Sort of lace-up job, I should think. Mm. No, I, I can't don't sketch it because my hand starts trembling. <laughs> <laughs> you think very low with lace-up like that. What shape was the neck opening? I didn't look at the neck. <laughs> <laughs> well, the necks and the ladies and the paintings are always lying around at very racy picnics, aren't they? Mm. And they're cut very, very low, revealing half the breasts. And there's usually a bit of lace around. And they're velvet and they're laced up but or satin. Round or square. The neck opening. Um, <laughs> yes, that's right. Uh, sort of boat shaped. <laughs> Very poor kind of boat. A round or a square boat, which you <laughs> I think one and a half. If it was punch shaped, they'd be flat bottoms. <laughs> <clears throat> a Watteau bodice is a woman's bodice with a square opening at the neck and short ruffled sleeve, so you've got bits of it. And it was named after Antoine Watteau, the yes. French painter who loved painting ladies in this particular garment. And Scott James, what is the Malagasy Republic better known as? Malagasy? It must be somewhere in the Pacific. No. It's, a, it's an island that changed its name when it... Um, Madagascar, That's what I want. Was. That's, oh. it. that's what I wanted. One and a half. Malagasy Republic is the new official name of the island state of Madagascar, which was formerly a colony and is now completely independent. And it's, um, though in the native language, it's probably a word of foreign origin. Frank Muir, what part does Eric Blair play in the novel 1984? Well, he made his entrance and his exit, <laughs> performed his function and... Uh... <laughs> disappeared from literature. This is a fairly trick question, Frank, I think. A very uh, untricky so, answer, I don't know. He wasn't in it at all. Was he it? wasn't in it. It he was, was all a, it's all a rotten trick. It's quite contrary, he, he wasn't was not in, in it. it. No, but, but, uh, <laughs> he had an awful lot to do with it. That's the bit I'm trying to get out. Ah. And you forget about aliases. No, I don't think I can help much on this. Um, no, I can't give you any marks. Oh. He wrote it. George Orwell was the pen ah, name ah. of Eric Blair, who was the actual author of this and of Animal Farm. Well, now we come to the last round and go back to those quotations I gave the two teams earlier in the programme. For two marks, Dillis Powell, can you give me the origin of your quotation, anyone for tennis? Well, it's always used as a, a kind of joke against the drawing room play in which somebody rushes in with a racket to a rather well-bred assembly and says, anyone for tennis? It usually happened at a particular kind of moment in the play, I think. Early. Ah! <laughs> <laughs> Not quite. Um, oh, well, at a crisis. That's was... it. That's what I wanted. Oh. Two marks. Anne Scott James, I like the origin of your quotation, here today, gone tomorrow. Well, something that's always happening to money. <laughs> <laughs> But it's an old, 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 old saw or adage. <laughs> I think I'm bound to give you two marks for that because I can't disprove it. It's um, a proverb, here today, gone tomorrow. But the first reference, which I think can be found, is in 1616 in um, a chap called Drax. In uh, 1731, in Poor Robin's Almanac, the world is full of vicissitudes. We are here today and gone tomorrow as the shoemaker said when he was going to run away. It is a joke I doubt if Jimmy Edwards would have used. <laughs> uh, so you get your two marks. And I shall ask uh, Frank and Dennis to give me their explanations of how these quotations came into being. And for this round, the marks will go to whichever incredible explanation receives the longer applause from the audience here in the theatre. So back to Frank Muir and his quotation, anyone for tennis. What a strange twist of fate, because... Uh, I've spent a lifetime researching into the origin of this phrase. Actually, in our village, the um, Thorpe in Surrey, the, um, the first mention is in the Surrey Herald of August the 14th, uh, 1928. And it was the, the arrival of the first fruit machine 
to the Red Lion pub. <laughs> and it seems that the first... It was opened, the inaugural pull on the one-armed bandit's one arm was um, fell to the lot of one Ernie Capaldi, who was a boy employed at the garage. And apparently he won on his first pull, and there was, a, there was a, the foot lined up, and there was a nice clatter in the little dish at the bottom. And the Surrey Herald headline for that date was Ernie won for tanners. <laughs> But I thought it surely must go back further than that, because I remembered when, when Dennis and I were very young, on Saturday mornings, we used to... We were say, sort of five and six and seven we were at that age. I was between the ages of eight, because I was a bit more difficult. But we, we, were, we used to play cricket on Wanstead Flats, and we were terribly poor in those days, and um, really poor, you know. We, we, our families couldn't afford overcoats, so... In October, our fathers used to varnish us for the winter. <laughs> but we did love our games because it was healthy for us. And I was rather good at cricket. And I always used to remember my little apple cheeks flushed with the exercise, leading Dennis, who was always rather way-faced, back to, to his mummy. And she'd say, how'd you get on? And I'd say, um, 47 runs me, not out. I always remember she used to say so wistfully, any run for Dennis. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, if you go back into the ancient days of Egypt, there you can find the secret to the first use of this. The first use of that phrase was actually round a small glass phial found in the tomb of an Egyptian queen. Uh, she was uh, excavated some years ago, the, uh, the mummy, and the French archaeologists uh, discovered it and, and believed that uh, she actually had nine breasts. Um, anyway, Queen Nefertiti um, <laughs> was, <coughs> was, was, buried, was buried in her sarcophagus with this sort of tear glass, and in it was a kind of rusty uh, powder and they wondered what it was. There was a hieroglyphics around the top, which, which were very crude, and they couldn't decipher. But only recently they were deciphered, and that is the first ever recorded use of this phrase in the world. And what it was, it, it just described what was in the vase, which was a sort of hair dye thing which the Queen used when she visited North Africa. And that's where the phrase comes from. The actual phrase is, henna worn for Tunis. <laughs> We pass on to Dennis's line, and Dennis Norden has here today, gone tomorrow. I've had some very strange encounters in gentlemen's cloakrooms, <laughs> but I think the most illuminating one was fairly recently in the gentleman's cloakroom of a luxury hotel in the heart of London's West End. The behaviour of the chap at the next basin caught my eye. What he was doing was he was nodding his head up and down and then shaking it from side to side and then nodding his head up and down again and shaking it from side to side again. I watched him do this for about seven minutes. I couldn't restrain my curiosity any longer and I say, excuse me, sir, but are you in the middle of some deep internal conflict? <laughs> and he said, no. He said, look. And turning to me, he made this up and down gesture with his head and side to side gesture with his head again and said, now look, when I did that, did you notice something happening? And he's, I said, yes, I did. He said, what? I said, well, your hair shifted. <laughs> he said, exactly. He said, you see, it isn't my hair. So I said, well, do you mean you're, you're breaking it in for a friend? <laughs> <clears throat> and he said, 
No, no. <laughs> and he became rather choked with emotion. He said, you see, I, I have the misfortune to be bald. And I said, well, not to worry. I said, they, because they, they do say that baldness is an indication of virility. He said, that may be, he said, but when you've got it, you have very little chance to prove it. <laughs> um, and then he told me his story. Having been bald from a very early age, he'd become very shy and had little opportunity of mixing with the opposite, and this is his word I use, sex. Um, however, a chance advertisement in the paper had caught his eye about this very latest male fad, which is false hair pieces. So he'd purchased one, joined a tennis club where for the first time he'd found himself among mixed gender, and he had made the acquaintance of a young lady whom he'd got very fond of, and after a whirlwind courtship, he'd brought her to this hotel to dine tonight with the express intention of proposing to her. Without telling her that he was actually masquerading under what you might call an assumed mane. <laughs> he didn't intend to tell her that until after she'd said yes. However, and here he continues the story, he said, horror of horrors, just as the dessert was served, I felt this sudden draft upon my cranium. He said, so I quickly made a trumped-up excuse, made my way hither, and now I've been looking at it, and every movement loosens it more. I said, surely they're not supposed to do that. <laughs> of course not, he said. It, it's my own fault. He said, they're held on by sticking plaster, which you're supposed to renew daily. But in the excitement of looking forward to this evening, I forgot to renew it. He said, if you have any humanity at all, have you anything about your person which is sticky or adhesive... I said, well, there's surely a first aid cabinet in this hotel of this size that would... Ba he said, I've looked. He said, they've got everything but sticking plaster. They've got bandages, lint, iodine, splint. I said, well, that's... I said, what about bandages? Suppose you go bandage your head up and go back with it all bandaged up and say that while you were away, you, you had an accident. You, you, you dropped your cigarette case and when bending down to pick it up, the seat fell on your head. <laughs> he said, no, no, he said, it, it, I wouldn't feel right proposing in a turban. He said, he said, something sticky. That's, I said, well, suppose I went into the restaurant and I ordered a baked apple. <laughs> on the top of it, they have those... That sort of toffee bit. No, no, he said, because it might run in the heat of the emotion. He said, surely, sir. He said, you are my last chance for my future happiness. Can you think of anything with which I could hold this down? And at that moment, it came to me. I took out my wallet, solved his problems. Fifteen seconds later, he was back in the restaurant, and I received a piece of their wedding cake this morning. <laughs> The lesson I learned from it, which I would like to pass on to anybody who might be wearing one of these ornamental thatches, is simply a piece of advice for the future. Let your wallet be filled at all times with what mine was. In other words, two thrupney stamps and a fivepenny. <laughs> Otherwise, you can find yourself in the position of the ancient proverb, hair today and gone tomorrow. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, that harrowing hairpiece story of uh, Dennis Norden's wins the contest of the two stories, but nevertheless, the entire contest is won by the other team, Dennis Plough and Frank Muir, by one and a half marks, and that brings to an end this edition of My Word.
In My Word, you heard Dillis Powell, Anne Scott James, Frank Muir and Dennis Norton, introduced by Jack Longland. The programme was devised by Tony Shryan and Edward J. Mason and presented by the BBC. been listening to my word from the BBC heard each week at this time this is the WFMT Fine Arts Network BBC presents My Word. And here to introduce the programme and the panel is Jack Longland. My Word is a word game played by people whose business is words, and those taking part are Anne Scott James, Frank Muir, Dillis Powell, and Dennis Norton. And round one tests their vocabulary. Two marks if they get the meaning of these words right. Beginning with Anne Scott James. Anne, what is tippy? Dennis? Well, it sounds like a, a sort of northeast England dialect word of affection. <laughs> She's my tippy. She's my tippy, darling. And I'm her Joe. He you can't know. disprove no. it anyway, can he? No, he can't really. Perhaps Somebody. Could you give us one of those? Ex- extremely unhelpful well, hints. stick to what you might possibly drink. Oh, you might possibly well, drink. I mean, some very, very strong alcohol, it means. <laughs> <laughs> Having almost entirely the opposite. <laughs> Got to have oh, much, much yes. more tannin in it. <laughs> it's, well, it is to do with tips, you see. Yes, that's it. Um, oh, yes. Oh, yes. It's tea it's tip. Tea. Yeah. It's just tea, we think. Well, I helped you rather a lot. Oh, I think no. one and a half is fairly generous. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> Tippy is a word used to describe a kind of tea, the one that has the highest proportion of golden tips, which are the leaf buds of the tea plant. And uh, I mustn't quote it, but there is one well-known brand of tea which uh, sort of yes, goes to I... town on this one. <laughs> one and a half. Thank you. What is Winstone? W H I N and then Stone. Winstone or Win? Winstone. The little church on the hill. Is it the rock on which that stands? The the, the church hill. The Winstone. <laughs> Winstone Church Hill. <laughs> Right. No, it isn't, is it? No. You're, right. No, you're right about the rock, uh, Frank, but where does it come from? I and mean, which bit of the country would you find it in, and what is it? Um, uh, Scottish. Uh, yeah. Not, no, no. 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 Durham. S- Round about... Well, that will work. Stick to the Pennines. How? Mm. Stick to the Pennines. Mm. Uh, it's, a, it's a form of stone found in the Pennines, which, mm-hmm. has, which has peculiar properties which escape me at the moment. <laughs> <laughs> but on the other hand, which you didn't ask me but for. But wind, wind grows on it, don't you think? Wind? wind. I'll, give, I'll, wind. Give you, I'll give you one mark for that, one out of two. It is a kind of rock. It's usually basalt. It can be a hard sandstone, and you find it up the Pennines where there's a great sheet of basalt called the wind sill. And one theory about how it got its name is that it might be the kind of very, very rocky soil on which only gorse, firs, wind could grow. So one out of two. Dennis Powell, what is a stiver? S-T-I-V-E-R, stiver. Um, it's a bit of money. How much? Very little. Hello, two, two marks. Stiver is the smallest co- coin, the, a trifling amount, and it comes in phrases like to lose every stiver you possess or down to his last stiver. And it really comes from a real coin, a Dutch one called, I don't, I'm not really good at Dutch, but stiver, I think, which was a very small and now mercifully vanished Dutch coin. Now, Dennis Norton, the meaning of the word caseus, C-A-S-E-O-U-S, caseus. It's too much to hope that it's some kind of clay. <laughs> no, it isn't. <laughs> it's, uh... I think it might be cheesy. Well, I'm going on the, yes. on the windstone principle. Cheesy, pop. yes, I was thinking of, of... What's that stuff they use for making, making cream? Ca- casein. That's right. It? Absolutely right. 
It's some kind of chemical stuff that you have to put under the tap if you make sour cream, I believe. I might... Absolutely right, yes. Two marks. Caseous means of or like cheese or cheesy, and uh, it is comes from casein, which is the protein of milk, which is the basis of cheese, without which you couldn't make cheese at all. Two marks. Well, before we begin round two, I give each team a quotation for them to write down, and I hope the two women members of the team will go on studying those quotations, because at the end of the programme, I shall ask where the quotations come from. And Anne Scott James and Dennis Norton, your quotation is, A new broom sweeps clean. And Dillis Bowen and Frank, yours is, An ill-favoured thing, sir, but mine own. And then at the end of the programme, I shall ask Frank and Dennis to give me their ideas of how these came to be said or written. And so on to round two, which is a round of city titles or nicknames. For instance, we know that the city of the Seven Hills is Rome and the city of the Dreaming Spires or sometimes Screaming Choirs is Oxford. Um, for two marks, what city has got the following titles? Anne Scott James, the city of David. Well, you think it's Jerusalem? Yes, that's right. You could also hold it to be Bethlehem because there is a quotation in the Bible, the city of David where um, David and was born and Jesus Christ was born. It's usually Jerusalem. Two Could marks. be Florence, actually. It's where, yes, where Michelangelo David is. Well, that'd yeah. be a good one, too, yeah. Wouldn't it be a good one? I think <laughs> we'll, have, uh, we'll have eight. <laughs> and uh, we'll just sit out the next two rounds. Ah, uh, yeah. settle for two. Um, Frank Muir, Old Ricky. A-U-L-D and then Ricky. Old Ricky is uh, Edinburgh. But why? Well, because of the smoke. Yeah, that's all right. Which uh, is the name for London. Uh, Old Reeky <laughs> was the old name for Edinburgh, and I'm sure it's a very clean city these days, but at those times it, it produced so much smoke that uh, there was a mist or fog over it for a lot of the time. Dillis Power, the city of saints. And just to help you, I, I would go across the Atlantic. Oh, San Francisco. <laughs> that's Saint, a good one. Saint Only Louis. one. St. Louis. No, there are only oh. one saint in each case, though. There's no help. Oh, you want I want lots saints. of saints. Los Angeles. <laughs> well, that's oh, for yeah. lots of saints. Yes, <laughs> yes, now. Well, I don't want to enter a theological argument with you this, but saints are different from angels. <laughs> well, uh, it's very pernickety, I feel. Uh, lots of angels. Not lots of saints, things. lots of saints. They might be the opposite of former-day saints. Latter-day saints? Yes. Ah, m uh, Mormons, uh, b b um, Utah, you know. Mm. Yeah. Really? Salt Lake's? Yes, Salt Lake City. I'll give it to you for Salt Without Lake. any help, no, too. No, no. <laughs> <laughs> One out of two only. Uh, it can be Salt Lake City in Utah, the state of Utah, which was given this title because of the Mormons, so-called Latter-day Saints, who lived there. But the normal one is Montreal in Canada because all the streets in that city are named after saints. So it's City of Saints. Dennis Norton, the cities of the plain... Cool. Isn't that the biblical thing, isn't it? Yes. Isn't it? Yes, Sodom, Sodom and Gomorrah. Yeah. <laughs> Sodom and Gomorrah it is. They were the cities in the plain and they were destroyed by fire or earthquake. The next round's about origins and derivations and because this is a bit more complicated, we give three marks this time because what I meant, me want members of the team to do is first of all to define the present meaning and then to give me the origin or derivation of these words or expressions or phrases. And Scott James to swap horses in midstream. Well, it means to change your goal or direction and switch over to something else. I mean, supposing you're decided to <laughs> be a politician, you'd change your mind and think you'd like to be a miner. That's swapping horses in midstream. No, midstream we've rather left out. For some yeah, reason or other, it's generally taken to refer to the leader, to change the leader, whereas yeah. a horse would rear. I mean, truly, it would be the, it would be the servant. Yeah. Oh, I've saw. been using it wrong all my life. And Have you? <laughs> and you don't remember the occasion on the origin of this phrase? Well, it would be very unwise if you got into the middle of a deep river, wouldn't yes. it, to change your horse? That's right, that's the point. It means to change your leaders at the height of a crisis, which is sometimes an ill-advised thing to do. But it's usually credited to Abraham Lincoln when, on the occasion when his fellow Republicans, although they were thoroughly dissatisfied with the way in which he wasn't winning the Civil War at that stage, they renominated him for president. And he said the Republican convention must have reached the conclusion that it's best not to swap horses when crossing a river. Three marks. Frank Muir, 
Morris dance. What was the question? <laughs> <laughs> Present meaning and how it comes to have that. Um, Morris dancing is a, is a dance. I knew the derivation of this now. It's a corruption, isn't it? Yes. Uh, uh, it's very easy to get corrupted in village halls. <laughs> hot atmosphere and all the lights and the music. Just as country dancing is a corruption of contra dancing, yeah. because people dance opposite each other. Yeah. Um, and it's a uh, morose dancing, it probably is. And nobody seems to enjoy uh, it much, do they? There's you're, you're bells getting, and handkerchiefs around their knees and things. You're getting awfully, awfully close, Frank. Um, if you tell Morisco tip? rather than morose. Morisco? French. Even no. Maurice. No, no. Mauritian. No. Hmm? Moorish? Yeah. My lovely partner suggests Moorish. Yes, well, I helped you a bit on that. It originally was a military dance, and danced by the Moors, or Moriscos, and came here from Spain, as many things did, with our soldiers uh, after the war abroad in the reign of Edward III. So it was the Moorish dance, and these were the Moorish or Morris men who danced it. Tell his power to square the circle. What do you mean now? Oh, I know well, this. Do you know it? Do yeah, you? this is navigation, isn't it? No. Nope. <laughs> <coughs> Geometry. To solve a rather difficult problem, I should think. Does it solve a difficult, diff solve a difficult problem? Well, you don't solve it. You don't solve it. Mm. Not to solve a difficult problem. Attempting to square the circle. Yes. Yeah. Trying to solve a difficult problem. And why is it difficult? Well, you circle... You try. It. It. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I want a bit more than that. Well, um, it was a, doubtless a problem in Euclid, which is almost impossible. <laughs> Quite a non erat demonstrant. <laughs> One and a half marks for good Latin quotation. Um, it means to attempt the impossible or to perform a demonstrable impossibility. And the point is that uh, it's impossible to determine exactly the ratio between the diameter and the circumference of a circle. And thus you can't construct a circle of the same area exactly as a given square. There is a figure for this, which is called pi, 3.14159, but it doesn't stop there. The next decimals would be 26537, but it then goes on ad infinitum. In fact, you can't do this. You can't have a square, which is exactly the same area as the circle. <laughs> Dennis Norton, yes. to turn turtle. Well, it, it, it means to capsize, to, to turn over. Um, How far? Completely. Yes. Over. Um, and it means to look like a turtle on its back. Yes, I think that's it. It means to turn completely over, over upside down, topsy turvy, and this is the doubt about it. It could be, uh, it's usually used of boats, because when they're turned upside down in the water, they're pretty helpless. In the same way, if you turn a turtle upside down, it doesn't know what to do next. But there is a very old word called turv, and an old English word called turflian which simply means to roll. It's possible that the turtle gets its name from this, rather than this phrase coming from the turtle. Ah, yes. The question with the chicken and the egg. We come now to the last round and go back to those two quotations I gave the teams earlier in the program. For two marks, and Scott James, mm. can I have the origin of your quotation? A new broom sweeps clean. Well, I think it's just a proverb, Jack. It is. Uh, you wouldn't know who put it in his book of proverbs. There aren't very many of these. Everybody, I think, has <laughs> ever done a book of proverbs. <laughs> is it that man called Hayward? Or uh, Hayward, well, Hayward, who yes, did it. a book of proverbs? Absolutely right. Two marks. Now, Dillis Poe, the origin of yours, please. An ill-favoured thing, sir, but mine own. Shakespeare, something. Yes. Shakespeare. Like <coughs> As you like it. Act five, scene four. <laughs> <laughs> mm. As you like it. Yeah, do you remember who said it? Act five, scene four. <laughs> <laughs> it's one of these things because it's a, it's a misquotation, and about 1895, in the early days of this show, we had a round of misquotations. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's, and it's a, a, a small thing, but my name people usually That's say. Right, yes. And I always course, remember this. It's Act five, scene four. <laughs> yes, you're absolutely right. Um, all right, give you two marks. <laughs> well, now I'm going to ask Frank and Dennis to give me their explanation of how these quotations came into being. And for this round... The marks will go to whichever incredible explanation receives the longer applause from the audience here in the theatre. So back to Dennis Norton and his quotation, a new broom sweeps clean. I don't know if you've been to any weddings lately, but if you have, you notice that, that something new is taking place. The latest thing is instead of having those ordinary wedding photographs, what people do is they have a cine film 
And I don't quite know why this, this change has taken place. I, I sort of worked out a theory that it may be that in, in later years, the husband can get a sort of bitter pleasure out of taking this cine film and putting it in the projector backwards. <laughs> so that in the end he walks away a free man. <laughs> anyway, as, as I have uh, a cine camera, I've been in pretty much demand over the past couple of years to take these kind of wedding films. And so I've been present at some pretty strange weddings, of which the weirdest was last summer. And this was a nudist wedding. <laughs> you see, I, I, I didn't know, actually, that it was going to be a, a nudist wedding. I, I, I got there, sort of bowled out, pitched up to this sort of country house place, and I saw these girls standing about. And what I thought, well, I thought, well, they'll never get mini skirts shorter than that. Because <laughs> I can't even see them. And then somebody explained what the sort of occasion it was, and everybody there had to strip off, including me, which I did, and after some initial uncertainty as to where to put the white carnation, <laughs> um, I, I joined the, the, the rest of the guests. Now, I must point out that it was all very dignified. It was this very secluded house, um, well set back from the road, it did seem a rather natural and rather beautiful way of having a wedding, except for the best man. <clears throat> now, quite apart from the fact that at a nudist wedding, the very phrase, best man, takes on a debatable aspect. <laughs> <clears throat> one, one problem... One problem arose, which I was very curious about. And in fact, it's a question which could be put in one of those intelligence tests that they always give people these days. Where, at a nudist wedding, does the best man keep the ring? <laughs> well, I'll tell you, actually. He keeps in the same place as he does in any other wedding. Well, obviously not in the waistcoat pocket itself, because they don't wear a waistcoat, but in the same anatomical location. How? With a length of sticking plaster. I was very intrigued by this, but it was explained to me that this is actually a very old nudist custom. And I'll tell you something else about that custom. It doesn't work. <laughs> when it got to the part, will you place the ring upon her finger, the best man reached to this anatomical location just below the left lower rib cage and placed in the hand of the bridegroom an empty length of sticking plaster. <laughs> well, of course, there was absolute chaos then. Pandemonium didn't just rain, it, it absolutely poured. <laughs> and it was magnificent for me with the cine camera because I don't know if you've ever seen about 50-odd distinguished-looking ladies and gentlemen searching the grass down on their hands and knees, <laughs> all completely stark. <laughs> but if you have, you will realise it is a very much a cinematic image, <laughs> um, which I took advantage of. Anyway, they went scrabbling around for about half an hour, after which time they thought, well, we, heaven knows when we'll find it, so they proceeded by borrowing from me uh, a metal ring which I used as a lens cap and the couple were wed and we went into the house and had this sort of champagne reception and the last shot in my film shows the bridegroom as the shadows were lengthening across the lawn tramping up and down the grass with a vacuum cleaner on a very, very long lead, grimly and methodically searching in vain still for the lost ring. In fact, this la it was so, such an effective scene that I used this proverb of John Haywood's to caption that particular last reel. A nude groom sweeps green. <laughs> <laughs>
charming picture, but absolutely no prizes for telling Dennis where he can put his carnation. <laughs> and we go on to uh, the other story from Frank Muir, and if you remember, his quotation was, an ill-favoured thing, sir, but mine own. <clears throat> One of my pleasures in life is strolling through the streets, talking to people if the mood takes me. One day I was walking along with a very agreeable stranger and we walked along together for a while and he suddenly said to me, tell me, why is it at Broadstairs High School in 1929 you failed to win the Maud Skeffington Memorial Prize for clay modelling? <laughs> Um, I would like to answer that question. In 1929, I was about nine, and passing through an unusually revolting stage. Um, I, I'm now six foot six, but then, of course, I wasn't. I was only nine, and I was only six foot three. <laughs> uh, on the other hand, let me tell you something of the other actor in this drama, Ethel Pennyquick. I came across a photograph of her recently. I was clearing some rubbish, pushing some rubbish aside in the loft. A relation of my wife was coming to stay for the night and <laughs> I, I found this this old photograph of her um, she she had a curious look on her face it wasn't gamine it was fey it was what's the word it was gutsy <laughs> she loved eating she had a, a very she was about eight and my pleasure in life was to take her to the pictures now, the big bonus of the year was the Maud Skeffington Memorial Prize for clay modelling, which I always won. And the prize was a fountain pen to the value of five shillings. Now, a fountain pen to the value of five shillings is worth five shillings. So I could flog it for four shillings and feed up my madam, you see. Now, Maud Skeffington was a lady given to good works and overpopulated gardens. And she set the subject, which was things like... Tinkerbell the fairy, um, a sad newt. And this particular year was a happy gnome. So this, this was child's play to me, out with the plasticine. I knocked up a very, a very happy gnome, indeed. Long ears, cherubic smiling face, nice rosy cheeks, nice green pointed hat packed it away in a bit of wrapped up newspaper in a cardboard box and prepared to escort Ethel Pennyquick to the pictures. Now, unfortunately, I hadn't any money and I had no food, so I decided to make some Turkish delight. This called for camel's milk. Uh, I couldn't find a camel, but I did find a, a humpbacked cow, oddly enough. <laughs> so I had this, this cow's milk. You, you warm it up and you mix it in with gelatine and you add this, you boil it actually with gelatine, and the effect was really rather exotic. So I made a box of this, pressed it firm, it's rather peculiar consistency, went off to meet Ethel in the pictures. I sat there sort of red with embarrassment at having a girl next to me and watched the film, and she champed away at my Turkish delight in the darkness. Back we came. Following morning, time to take in my award-winning um, model to, uh, to the headmaster, picked up the box, phone rang. Ethel Pennyquick's mother. What has happened? Ethel has been taken off to hospital. I'm afraid it's a stomach pump job. They've got to get a pound and a half of plasticine out of her. <laughs> box under arm, I thought, wait a minute. <laughs> Undid the box, and in the box, no model gnome but a beautifully set batch of Turkish delight. I realised I'd taken my box, my model, and fed it to Ethel Pennyquick <laughs> during the pictures, and she stuffed it down her stupid self <laughs> and was now in hospital. Well, of course, it's absolutely hopeless. I had no time. I was on my way to school to, to, to make a decent model. And so I rushed out into the garden, got a beetroot, stuck half a carrot on its silly head to look like a... a a red hat, um, stuck a couple of currants to make eyes, peeled a big potato for the body, stuck that together, rushed it to the headmaster. He looked at this and said, uh, what is this monstrosity with scarlet fever? <laughs> and I said, well, what could I say? Sir, an ill-fevered thing, sir, but my gnome. <laughs> Well, 
By your vote, ladies and gentlemen, the contest of the two stories is won by Dennis Norton, and he and his teammate, Anne Scott James, also win the entire contest, and this brings to an end this edition of My Word. In My Word, you heard Dillis Powell, Anne Scott James, Frank Muir, and Dennis Norton, introduced by Jack Longland. The programme was devised by Tony Shryan and Edward J. Mason and presented by the BBC. You've been listening to My Word from the BBC, heard each week at this time. This is the WFMT Fine Arts Network. presents My Word. And here to introduce the program and the panel is Jack Longland. My Word is a word game played by people whose business is words. Those taking part are Dillis Powell, Dennis Norton, Anne Scott James and Frank Muir. Here's round one to test their respective vocabularies. For two marks, can you give me the meaning of these words? We begin with Dillis Powell. Dillis, what's the meaning of colliery? Um, a long time ago, when um, films began having colour and technicolour, an American critic said that colour, technicolour would never be any good as long as the actors looked like roast turkey. Mm. <laughs> Was it that mm. kind of colour? That kind of colour, very much, yes. It's a commercial term, a trade term, means that a particular product has a colour, such a colour as denotes good quality. And it can be used of hops, which have to be a particular kind of yellowy green, or coffee, which I don't know what good coffee is supposed to look like, I never know. Don't get it mixed up. <laughs> but one or other of them. So it's colour is a trade term. Dennis Norton, what is a murex? M-U-R-E-X. <laughs> It isn't a former wife of Frank. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Do you want a murex? I think it's a mollusk, isn't it, yes. from which the Roman, the Tyrian purple used to come. Yes, quite right. Because it's I think exuded. it's a mollusk from which the... <laughs> <laughs> yes, all right, two marks between you. It's a shellfish which yields a purple, I think some people would say a, a crimson, because Roman purple really was crimson, a purple dye, and it comes in um, Browning, who fix, fished the murex up, and what porridge had John Keats, two very difficult lines, and it occurs in the Mediterranean. Two marks. And Scott James, what is a hackery? H-A-C-K-E-R-Y, hackery. Well, it's either a second-class riding stable, that's not a bad shot. Beast, beasts of transport. Yes, a, a, well, a, getting... mule for, a mule for her. No, I give you one out of two, which is fairly generous. Rent a mule. <laughs> <laughs> it's an Indian bullock cart. <laughs> <laughs> um, it's mainly used, this Indian bullock cart, for transporting freight or goods. Though there was a lighter version, which I think was used sometimes for people, and it's a... It's, uh, sort of vulgarization of a Hindu word. Now, Frank Muir, what is the meaning of annulate? It's what, <coughs> how Henry VIII greeted. <laughs> <laughs> Need I say more? <laughs> His uh, tardy bride-to-be from Flanders. <laughs> yes. Annulate. It's something to do with the annual rings found um, on the inside of trees, <laughs> if cut across. They are annulate. In other words, they are ringed. You're absolutely right. You get your two marks. <laughs> oh. <laughs>
I haven't heard it applied to trees before, but it perfectly well could be because it means marked or furnished with rings or formed of rings. It could be um, a sort of tube made of segments, one after the other, each of them being a ring. And it comes from a Latin word meaning a small ring. You've got it absolutely right. Before we begin round two, I give each team a quotation for them to write. And then I want the two women members of the team to go on looking at those quotations. Because before we finish, I shall ask them where the quotations come from. And Dillis Powell and Frank Muir, your quotation is, I do like to be beside the seaside. <laughs> and Anne Scott James and Dennis, yours is a happy issue out of all their afflictions. And then at the end of the program, I shall ask Dennis and Frank to give me their idea of how these quotations came to be said or written. Round two is a round of questions about names and nicknames and so on. Two marks again. Dennis Powell, Potiphar was Pharaoh's captain of the guard, but he's somewhat less well remembered than his wife. Why? Well, uh, Potiphar's wife got into some kind of um, bed trouble. <laughs> <laughs> With Potiphar? No, no, that's the point. With Joseph. Joseph was accused yes. of getting into trouble or yes. getting her into trouble. Yes. She's recorded, uh, Potiphar's wife, as having tried to seduce Joseph while he was in Egypt with the Israelites, and he repulsed her and fled, leaving his garment behind, and she used that as evidence and uh, falsely accused him, and he got shoved into clink, and it was all very unfair. Two marks. Dennis Norton, who or what was known as a Johnny Come Lately? C O M E. Johnny Come Lately. Nobody is. Right. Um, I don't they use that to mean a sort of upstart or. Yes, a kind of upstart. Um, put, it, put it in the right hemisphere, Dennis. I'll give you two marks. Is it like Johnny Comes Marching Home? Is it? No, not, no, I think that, no, I think that'd be a false trail. Uh, I should go a bit south. Or a long way south. Australian. Yes. Australian. Yes. Is yes. it? Oh, how nice. We, we, uh, we haven't had a, 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 a derivation from Australia. Um, this is a guest word. Uh, <laughs> and welcome all the way from the Antipodes. Here is Johnny Come Lately. <laughs> what record would you like? Oh, do you think it's somebody who's just, <laughs> just arrived from England? Yes. Parvenu. Ah, oh, yes. Just come from England. A see. greenhorn, as we That's say. That's it. Exactly right. You've got fought your way home. It's an Australian term for a recent immigrant, and therefore, by inference, a very inexperienced immigrant who doesn't know very much about the land he's arrived in. Anne Scott James, we've heard of Mr. U Nu, who was formerly Premier of Burma, but what does the U stand for? Mr. <laughs> U Nu. <laughs> hmm. Oh, it's Mr. Yes, Mr. Nu. That's it. <laughs> it's the, um, name All right. Oh, Two marks. Uh, U is the Burmese equivalent of Mr. And so you shouldn't talk about Mr. U Nu or even about Mr. U Thant at the United Nations. Frank Muir, who was Molly Bloom? Molly Bloom was um, a fictional character, yes. Jack, from an Irish novel. Yes. Set in Dublin. Yes. And she was the very feminine wife of Leopold Bloom in James Joyce's Ulysses. Yes. <laughs> All right, and two marks. Well, in the next round, the uh, unrepentant compiler of this program has taken some favourite and much-loved examples of English verse, added on his disgraceful lines to them, and he asked members of the team for three marks to give me, first of all, the correct version, and then the name of the poet. We begin again with Tillis Powell. The boy stood on the burning deck whence all but he had fled, He'd stayed behind to wash his neck before he went to bed. <laughs> That's not right. That's not right. It's all right, guess I do. A cannonball blew off his leg, so he stood upon his head. <laughs> <laughs> I know the name of the boy. Yes, that'd be a help. Casabianca. Yes, yes. And the name of the author? Junior. <laughs> <laughs> the name yes. of the author, she was a lady. Yes. <laughs> Yes, it's Hem Hem or Hem Hem Hemans, I think. Hemans, Hemans. Yes, Hemans. Casabianca by Felicia Dorothea Hemans, 
and uh, she wrote a lot of other well-known poems. This is Casabianca. And the real version is, The boy stood on the burning deck whence all but he had fled. The flame that lit the battle's wreck shone round him or the dead. That's a pretty tough scene. Now, Dennis Norton. The shades of night were falling fast as through an alpine village passed a youth who bore, mid snow and ice, a cage full of performing mice. <laughs> Good technique, then. Um, Ruth who bore amid snow and ice a banner with a strange device. That's right. Excelsior. Good. Remember who wrote it? Longfellow. Good. Three marks it is. Well done. And now Anne Scott James. I wandered lonely as a cloud that floats on high or vales and hills when all at once I cried out loud, hot rum is best for colds and chills. And all, what when, when all at once I saw a crowd. Cloud. Crowd. Crowd. A cloud. Yeah, crowd. A house. Of golden gold. daffodils. Well done. Mm. It's Wordsworth, I wandered lonely as a cloud, and it's about daffodils and not about rum. And now, uh, Frank Muir, gather ye rosebuds while you may, old time is still a-flying, and what is offered free today, tomorrow you'll be buying. <laughs> Robert Herrick. Yes. Author of Little by Little. <laughs> um, it's a poem to virgins on recommending them not to be. Yes. Um, <laughs> it's it's um, tomorrow you'll be dying. That's it. There's one with flowers, aren't they? One line in between. Gather your rosebuds while you may. Old time is still a flying, and this same flower that smiles today, tomorrow will be dying. And it's Robert Herring to virgins to make much of time. Well, now a round of odd men out. What I do is to give each member of the teams an assortment of names and titles and so on. And for two marks, I want them to tell me which is the odd man out and why. Dillis Powell, Rue, Ratty, Eeyore, and Piglet. It's Ratty. Windy. Ratty is Wind in the Willows. And the others? Um, a. a. Milne. Milne. Mm -hmm. Absolutely right. All right, two marks it is. Ratty is the odd man out. Rue and Eeyore and Piglet are all characters from A. A. Milne's Pooh and Christopher Robin books, whereas Ratty is a rather more serious character from Kenneth Graham's <coughs> Wind in the Willows. Two marks. Dennis Norton, the big sleep, the high window, farewell, my lovely, and the thin man. Ah, oh, yeah. Um, the thin man was by Dashiell Hammett. Yes. And the others were by Raymond Chandler. Well done. Well and done. what were they? They were they were uh, Philip Marlowe stories uh, of um, well not yes crime stories but they yep. were novels. Yes, quite right. The three Big Sleep, The High Window, Farewell, My Lovely were well known detective stories by Raymond Chandler. But The Thin Man, like The Glass Key, was a story by Dashiell Hammett and also a film. And Scott James. The Tower of London, Old St. Paul's, and a Journal of the Plague Year. Oh, no. Two of them were by Harrison Ainsworth. Which ones? The Tower of London and Old St. Paul's. Quite, yes. The Journal of the Plague Year. It's Defoe. Isn't yes. It? The Tower of London and Old St. Paul's were 19th century novels written by W. Harrison Ainsworth, whereas the Journal of the Plague Year, although equally fictitious, was purported to be a journal, and was written about the year of plague, which was 1665, by Daniel Defoe in 1722. Frank Muir, Wordsworth, Coleridge, Browning, Southey. Southey, Wordsworth, and Coleridge were mates, weren't they? Yes. And Browning's mate was Elizabeth Barrett. <laughs> <laughs> they were the late poets. Yes. And in fact, Browning was later, wasn't he? Yes, he was. He didn't like Wordsworth. No. Two marks it is. Uh, Wordsworth, Coleridge and Southey, as Frank Miller says, all knew each other and were friends. And they were the so-called lake poets because they lived a lot of time in the lake district and wrote poetry about it. Whereas Browning was later <coughs> different and if you associate him with anything, probably you do, do with Italy rather than the lake district. Now we come to the last round and go back to those two quotations I gave the teams earlier in the program. Two marks, Dillis Powell, can you give me the origin of your quotation? I do like to be beside the seaside. I do like to be beside the sea. It's a popular song, Victorian period. Mm, a little later than that. But, uh, Edwardian. Yeah. <laughs> yes, that's near enough. Two marks. Now, Anne Scott James. 
Can I have the origin of your quotation? A happy issue out of all their afflictions. Well, it sounds like a prayer. It is. I think... It comes from the Book of Common Prayer, a happy issue out of all their afflictions, and it's the prayer for all sorts and conditions of men, which is a jolly nice sort of blanket title because it brings in everybody. Now I'm going to ask Dennis and Frank to give me their explanation of how these quotations came into being. And for this round, the marks will go to whichever incredible explanation gets the longer applause from the audience here in the theatre. So back to Frank Muir and his quotation, I do like to be beside the seaside. Good evening. <laughs> <laughs> the other night I, I was in the middle of a very busy bar and a man came up to me. It was an extremely busy bar. It was the, uh, the seventh bar of Vorjak's New World Symphony. <laughs> and he said, may I compliment you on the way you are humming the seventh bar of Vorjak's New World Symphony? I said, thank you. He said, but I meant another subject. He said, um, my word. He said, why do you always twist the last lines? You know, if somebody gave you a line like, I do like to be beside the seaside, it always ends up, I goo dyke to bay beside the hui fide or something. He said, why can't you just do it without messing about with the words? You should say that. <laughs> because that, I do like to be beside the seaside, um, it, it came up quite recently without any, any sort of twisting. I mean, the, the line just sort of came out. It was with one of my inventions. Um, I don't know whether you, you're aware that um, I, I do these inventions. I invent quite a lot of things. I have this curious mind, you know. What this country really needs is a three-sided gramophone record. <laughs> because when you think about a normal gramophone record you buy, it's got two tunes on it. One's marvellous, which is why you buy it, and the other one's always lousy on the other side. But if a gramophone record had three sides, you see, ha-ha, you see, they'd write a good tune and put it on the front, the, the first side. Then they'd write a, a bad tune, as they always do. Then it would be the time to write a good tune again, you see. <laughs> so when one record would have two good tunes and only one lousy one, which would be marvellous, you see. So I set to work. I, I made my first three-sided record quite simply by getting three ordinary gramophone records and putting sticky tape on them and making a sort of pyramid. And that worked quite well, except when you put the put it on the gramophone, it didn't turn round because the arm got locked in the middle of it. <laughs> My breakthrough thought was to make a very thick gramophone record, about an inch thick, and then turn it on its side and put the third record sort of round and round the edge like the original Edison cylinders. And that really works terribly well. All you need to do is to is to amend a gramophone so that it's got a little spindle sticking out of the side. You then play the top and the bottom, and you stick it on sideways so that it's vertical, swing the arm out, and then it'll play the third side that way. And I've, I've made one of these, and I've, I've, I've composed three songs for it. The first one is a protest song. It's called um, uh, Singing with the Wind. And that's... Um, uh, it's a song about... Um, it's a sort of municipal protest song. There's no point in protesting about vague things. It's, Why don't I have more than two lampposts between us and Rosemary Lane? Why is the cesspit not emptied more than once a quarter? <laughs> now, now on, the, on the second side, I've written rather and recorded rather a stimulating song of the open road. Um, it goes rather vaguely. <coughs> Oh, when the wind is in the face and the soil is on the fire, when the hoil and the hay is in the wall, let the wall and the boy. It's very. The third one is rather, is rather a lyrical ballad. I think it's terribly nice. It's, it goes sort of, um, to be beside the one I love, to be beside my dream. To be beside myself with love <laughs> is to be beside you, my dear. <laughs> so you see, I'm, I'm going to be very rich because either they're going to buy the, uh, the whole invention or I think they're going to buy that last tune, because, which will make me a lot of money too, because quite frankly I don't very much care for the protest song, the A-side. 
and I don't think much of the Song of the Open Road, the B-side. But I do like to be beside the seaside. <laughs> perfectly frightful invention and we'll go on to Dennis Norton and if you remember his quotation is quite different a happy issue out of all their afflictions there'll be no singing because <laughs> <laughs> this is rather a sad one actually that phrase a happy issue out of all their afflictions will forever stand as a memento <coughs> to me to a chap called Herbert Tozer you know the phrase accident prone that doesn't quite sum him up. He's more what the posh lady economists are apt to call a victim personality. Perhaps if I said he's the sort of chap who gets run over by an ambulance. <laughs> Ever since I first knew him, life has treated Herbert like the back wall of a squash court. <laughs> bang 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 from all directions I first met him actually in the army where he earned the distinction of being the only soldier to get wounded during his preliminary medical inspection <laughs> <clears throat> you see while the while the uh, medical officer was sounding Herbert's chest a brigadier came in so Herbert threw up a salute in so doing, he caught his arm in the rubber tube of the stethoscope, <laughs> pulled it clean out the M.O.'s ears, and it snapped back smack into Herbert's teeth. <laughs> Discharged with a disability pension, <laughs> he was directed to agricultural work on a farm where a cow fell on him. <laughs> It's a very rare occurrence, I remember the vet saying. I've never known a cow faint while being milked. <laughs> but this one did. He just gave at the knees and toppled over sideways, <laughs> smack onto Herbert. Um, on his holiday, the only holiday he ever took, a sea cruise, he managed to get seasickness and lockjaw at the same time. <laughs> When I did meet him again after all these years, I must say I was rather shocked by the change in his appearance. He brought me up to date at what, on what had happened to him since we last met, and it was really like listening to a publicity trailer for Fox's Book of Martyrs. <laughs> in a restaurant, for example, he had choked on a small fish bone, which is not an unusual occurrence, but he happened to be eating chocolate mousse. <laughs> Another time, another time, on another occasion, he bent down to get some luggage out of his car, sprained his back, and was completely immobilized. What made it memorable, it was the first day of his honeymoon. Um, subsequently, his wife ran away, uh, clearing out his bank account, removing all the money from... Uh, his private account, taking away all the furniture, opening his wallet and licking all his postage stamps. <laughs> um, to say I was appalled at this chronicle I would be understated. I said, Herbert, a life like this, do you ever feel like ending it? Do you ever feel like it's too much? He said, well, only once. I've only once felt like it. He said, that was the time I stabbed myself on the aerial of a portable television set. <laughs> He said, I, I did feel, he said, I actually got as far as ringing up those people who ask you if you are at the end of your tether to ring them up any time, night and day. I said, what happened? <laughs> he said, I got the engaged signal. <laughs> <clears throat> I said, I don't understand you, Herbert. I don't understand a person like you. No future, no savings, no health. How do you live? Well, he said, I saved all the press cuttings about the things that have happened to me. 
and I've stuck them all together, painted them silver, and cut little things out of it. Look, and he opened a suitcase and showed me a lot of little silver horseshoes. He said, I sell lucky charms. <laughs> As I say, I can't hear that phrase without remembering Herbert today. A snappy horseshoe out of all the afflictions. <laughs> By your vote, ladies and gentlemen, the contest of the two stories is won by Dennis Norton, and he and his partner, N. Scott James, also win the entire contest, and that brings to an end this edition of My Word. In My Word, you heard Dillis Powell, N. Scott James, Frank Muir, and Dennis Norton, introduced by Jack Longland. The programme was devised by Tony Shryan and Edward J. Mason and presented by the BBC. BBC presents My Word. And here to introduce the programme and the panel is Jack Longland. My Word is a word game played by people whose business is words, and those taking part are Anne Scott James, Frank Muir, Dillis Powell, and Dennis Norton. Here's round one to test their respective vocabularies. Two marks if they get the meaning of these words right. We begin with Anne Scott James. Anne, what does this mean? Most people's eyelids are fimbriated. F-I-M-B-R-I-A-T-E-D, fimbriated. Eyelashed, aged, Ed fringed. Yes, yeah, that'll do. Two fringed. marks it is. Fimbriated means something which is fringed or bordered with hairs <laughs> or um, in can be botanical, which are sort of kinds of hairs, or zoological like Anne. And it comes from a Latin word, fimbria, meaning a fringe. Two marks. Frank Muir, what is a jamadar? Jamadar. It's um, Indian. Yes. Is it something a Helvidar salutes? Yes, he might. Well, it's a... It's an Indian native officer. Yes, you're absolutely dead right. Well done, Frank. <laughs> Dillis Powell, what's a logogram? Logo, and then G-R-A-M. Logogram. Um, it's, a, it's a wooden uh, gramophone. <laughs> <laughs> it's a written word. Of a particular kind. Uh, gram. Grammar is the complete word for grammata, for, for words in Greek, modern Greek anyway. Yeah. Uh, it's a short word. Yes, very short indeed. Shorthand. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yes, that'll do. Logogram for stenographers, shorthand typists and secretaries is the sign or character which represents a whole word in shorthand so that if their bosses talk very fast, they can still get it down. It can also mean a kind of anagram. Dennis Norton, what is a naiad? N-A-I-A-D, naiad. You know, this is the first time in about four years I've been given a word that I've actually come across. <laughs> <laughs> it's Greek mythology. Yes. And a naiad was a, was a sort of um, Miss Inland Waterway. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> 5,000 B.C. <laughs> she was, um, they, they were, uh, she or they or it was um, kind of goddess of streams and rivers and Abs sprite. She was a sprite. Abs nymph. Yeah. yeah. Absolutely right, Dennis, that's fine. Water nymphs, they were very beautiful and they lived in and they were the tutelary 
deities or spirits of rivers and springs, and you find them in Shakespeare, among other things. Two marks. Now, before we begin the second round, I give each team a quotation for them to write down, and the two women members of the team will go on studying those quotations, because at the end I shall ask them where the quotations come from. Anne Scott James and Dennis Norton, here's yours. History is bunk. And Dillis Bowen and Frank, your quotation is, take it from here. <laughs> author, author. <laughs> <laughs> and at the end of the programme, I shall ask Dennis and Frank to give me their ideas of how these came to be said or written. Round two is a round of odds and ends, two marks again. And Scott James, what were unpersons? Persons with UN in front of it. Unpersons. Bigwigs of the United Nations, I should say. <laughs> <laughs> it's a gallant can shot. Can you fault me on that? I mean, can you yeah. disprove that that would do? <laughs> I don't think it's actually been used, and that's the only thing I don't know. They could be Germans, mm. couldn't they? They, they, they? They're uns, aren't they? Un. Um. <laughs> <laughs> Illiterate. Mm. Illiterate German. Uh, cast your mind... This doesn't occur in Erewhon, does it? No, that's a good shot, though. Cast your mind forward from Erewhon to 1984. Oh, ho. Well, they come George Orwell's 1984, I would think. And who were they? Well, I should think they were absolutely subjugated, um, sort of brainwashed people. Hello, all the people who offended against authority and fell from grace were termed unpersons, and at that point of time, all mention of them was systematically removed from all the state records, so that officially these unfortunate unpersons didn't exist. Frank Muir, what was the guinea pig club? It was a club so-called. It was really a club, wasn't it, and they had a tie. <coughs> formed among servicemen during the last war <coughs> who were so badly burnt they had to undergo plastic surgery at a special clinic in the East Grinstead run by uh, oh, a Scotsman oh, and faltering, yes, yes, yes. yes. <laughs> <laughs> I know two people actually who were members, one was Jimmy Edwards, the mm. comedian and uh, Part of his grog blossom on his face is not, in fact, grog blossom at all, but it's uh, <laughs> scar tissue from when he was burnt um, mm. delivering troops to Arnhem. Mm. And the other one was a Rhodesian man called Godfrey Edmonds, who I think was the, the worst burnt pilot to, mm. to live, who was a friend of mine. That's good enough, Frank. Two marks. Uh, this is a club formed mainly for Allied airmen who had these... Um, Terribly difficult plus. Mackinder. Mackinder, that's right. Plastic surgery. Archibald. Archibald, Archibald. Mackinder. Archibald. That's right. And this was a wonderful plastic surgery clinic run by Archibald Mackinder at East Grinstead. Two marks. Dillis Powell, who were called the regicides? Well, they killed kings. Yeah. Tickle a lot. Tickle a lot. Do you know? Do Frank, help? Frank knows. Yes, yes, the, Frank knows. They're the ones who, who were alleged to have killed Charles I, weren't they? Yes. The regicides were the men who, in 1649, tried and condemned Charles I to death or took part in his execution. They included Oliver Cromwell. Dennis Norton, who was known as the Red Dean and why? Oh, that was, um... Uh, what was his name? Hewlett Johnson. Yes. Um, and he was known as the Red Dean because he was, he had socialist leanings and he used to go back and forth to Russia quite a lot. Quite right. And Dean of what? Dean Can of Canterbury. Can yes. Mm. Yes, well done. Two marks. <laughs> Well, in the next round, our compiler of questions has attempted to paint the lily and gild unrefined gold by altering certain well-known poems to suit himself. And he asks the teams for three marks this time, because it's more difficult, to correct these bogus quotations and also to give the name of the poet. We begin again with Anne Scott James. Lars Porsena of Clusium. By the nine gods he swore that if Arsenal got near Clusium's goal, they'd never, never score. <laughs> well, it's Macaulay. 
dreams of it, isn't it? It's one of the layers of robe. Can't we get a few marks? I used to call it Chap called Tarquin comes in. But Tarquin was a monster he'd proud he'd and also a dreadful no boss. <laughs> 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 oh, you make it terribly difficult for me. This is Macaulay's Lays of Ancient Rome, Horatius, Book One. Last portion of Clusium, by the nine gods he swore that the great house of Tarquin should suffer wrong no more. And they all marched in on Rome. Okay. Frank Muir, the log was burning brightly. It was a night that should banish all sin. For the dustmen had called off their dreary strike and emptied our bin. <laughs> I saw the old homestead and faces I loved. And I saw England's valleys and dales. And I listened with joy, as I did when a boy, to the sound of the old village bells. <laughs> the fire was burning brightly. It was a sight that would banish all sin. For the bells were ringing the old year out and the new year. <laughs> A magnificent rendering, Frank, and we know now who sung it, but who actually wrote it? <laughs> A miner. <laughs> it was the miner's dream of home. That's right. Do you remember the chap's name who wrote it? It's a bit difficult. Geo H. <laughs> Some girl in there. Uh, well, it has to be two and a half, I'm afraid, because you did absolutely magnificently. But the chap who wrote The Miner's Dream of Home was a man called William Godwin. Two and a half. Was it? <laughs> <laughs> two and a half. Silly me for not knowing that. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, it's a splendid rendering. Not the Archbishop. No, that's... no, no, that wouldn't do. <laughs> now, dear Spow, stone walls a nasty prison make, and iron bars a cage. So, yobbos, this advice please take. Do try and be your age. <laughs> it's terrible. It's uh, loveless. It? Yes. yes. It's loveless. Yes. Where is he writing He's in from? prison. Yes, to? To Althea. That's right. Two out of three. What's it all about, Althea? <laughs> 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 Richard Lovelace, the cavalier poet, uh, writing to his sweetie Althea from prison, wrote... Stone bars, sorry, stone walls do not a prison make, nor iron bars a cage. Minds innocent and quiet take that for an hermitage. <coughs> now, Dennis Norton, when all the world is young, lad, and all the trees are green, a maid's a lovesome thing, lad, if she is sweet sixteen. <laughs> That's rather pretty. <laughs> <laughs> I to swallow hard, then. <laughs> when all the world is young, lad, and all the trees are green, and then, and then, and then, and it's every lass a queen. Quite right, yes. It's not all the songs are sung, lad. That comes later, yes. No, that doesn't help yeah. in this particular line. It's all monosyllables, isn't it? Yes, it is. Mm. No, I don't know. Um, do you remember who wrote it? Don't remember that either. <laughs> <laughs> Two out of three for getting the last line right, and uh, but not knowing the poet. It comes from Young and Old by Charles Kingsley, and these were songs from the Water Babies, believe it or not. And it goes really when all look look look. look, look. <laughs> <laughs> it really goes when all the world is young, lad, and all the trees are green, and every goose a swan, lad, and every lass a queen. Then hay for boot and horse, lad, and round the world away. Young blood must have its course, lad, and every dog his day. Now we come to the last round and go back to those two quotations I gave the teams earlier in the programme. For two marks, and Scott James, can you give them the origin of your quotation? History is punk. Um, yes, it was a rather arrogant remark made by Henry Ford. Which one? The first. Yes. <laughs> That's all right, two marks. Henry Ford in court, in a libel action, against the Chicago Tribune in 1919. Uh, this immortal phrase dropped from his unprepared lips. History is bunk. Now, Dillis Powell, the origin of yours. Take it from here. It was the title of a very famous radio show. Yes. <laughs> in which our two heroes worked together for no less than 11 years. So two marks it is. 
Well, now I'm going to ask Frank and Dennis to give me their explanations of how these quotations came into being. And for this round, the marks will go to whichever incredible explanation gets the longer applause from the audience here in the theatre. And so back to Dennis Norton and his quotation, history is bunk. I, I very nearly didn't make this historic broadcast. Uh, I was late getting here because, you see, I came here on the underground on the Victoria line where they have these automatic ticket collecting machines. You know, they don't have these chaps who stand at the gate and take your tickets. What they have is on the exit gate, they have a slot in which you insert your ticket. And two things clamp down on it, devour it, take it down below, inspect it to see if it's got the right date, and if it all sort of checks out, the gate then opens and you can go through. And I presented my ticket to this slot, and I was wearing this pair of old gloves, which are rather large, <laughs> and the two things clamped down, sucked to the glove <laughs> off my hand, devoured it, and then the whole machine had kind of convulsions <laughs> and a sort of nervous breakdown. And I was delayed there for 20 minutes with all these uh, transport officials berating me for apparently mucking up the whole of our technological society. <laughs> And so when I got here, 20 minutes late, all the BBC bods were, were all out on the pavement out there looking at their wristwatches and, you know, tut-tutting and so on. And I must admit that I have been late several times before. But I wasn't worried this time, you see, because I had an excuse. <laughs> uh, they didn't believe it. And they, they punished me anyway. <clears throat> you see, I, I, I have to stay behind and after this, this and, and put out the rocking chairs for old time dancing. <laughs> <laughs> but it, it set me to thinking, you see, what people like me, people to whom God has not granted the precious gift of punctuality, what we need is an anthology of good excuses. And I set myself to thinking, what good excuses I'd heard in my life, ones that worked. And the first one that came to mind was a chap on another program I worked on who arrived also 20 minutes late, and as everybody rounded on him, he suddenly said, a most extraordinary thing happened. He said, I was just leaving home, and I stopped to have a glass of water, and as I drank it, the top of the glass broke off and a tiny little sliver lodged between my two top teeth there. And everybody sort of stopped and all their faces looked horrified. And they all turned around and said, yeah, it's just between there, like... <laughs> I, can, I can just imagine that. And they were all so busy talking about it, he kind of slipped in and... Now, I've heard him use this excuse four times since. <laughs> and every time it's had the same reaction of people living the moment with him. So, obviously, one of the first prerequisites of a good excuse is that people must identify with it. Now, another one which swam into my mind was a time when I'd ordered a minicab to go to the theatre. And it was half an hour late. And I was standing all ready to give the driver a mouthful, you know. And he burst out the car and he said, I'm terribly sorry, Gav. He said, but I had a terrible experience. He said, I came out the house and I was just crossing the pavement to get the car when out of the blue, a bird flew down and perched on my head. <laughs> and he said, it wouldn't budge. It just perched there. He said, I, I tried shooing it off and it would just fly away a few bits and then come back and sit on top of my head again. And he said, it's very strange having a bird on top of your head. It gives you a sort of funny feeling. <laughs> he said, and I didn't know what to do to get rid of it. He said, and I finally had to go back in the house. He said, and I rang up the RSPCA. He said, they took half an hour come, come in there. And he said, I couldn't get this bird off. I didn't want to hurt it, you know. And the man from the RSPCA came and, and he said it was what they call a pair bonding affinity. <laughs> that, and, if, that, and he said, oh, but I come 
well, you know, it was so interesting that we missed the first act of the play. <laughs> I never did find out what the story was. About. I can remember the name, Hamlet. <laughs> <clears throat> but everybody in the party was saying, oh, fantastic, you know, it's a territorial imperative. And these, you know, well, that is as far as I've got it, with my anthology of good excuses. We shall return to the subject at some other time. Um, but in the meantime, I hope these will help anybody who's listening who is late, as I was this evening, and if they will proffer these excuses, then they won't get the reception I got when I gave my excuse about the ticket machine. His story is bunk. <laughs> help us all if Dennis gives us several more installments. It'd be very useful. And now on to Frank Muir, and if you remember, his quotation was, take it from here. I've always had sort of certain irritations in life which have always infuriated me. I object very strongly to be told things and expected them to believe them. I want to know why. I want to know its relevance to me. One of the earliest jokes I ever knew was, um, uh, I can't do it, you can't do it. Can't do what? Milk chocolate. <laughs> you can milk chocolate. <laughs> what you do if you're me is you feed the cow <laughs> kettle cake covered in cocoa. <laughs> and after about three days of this, and you milk the cow, after about three days, the milk comes out just slightly chocolate coloured. <laughs> but in law, you could prove that that is, in fact, chocolate. Incidentally, you don't milk a cow by whizzing the tail up and down. Did you know that? <laughs> <laughs> I learned it. Um, tell you another one, which I was determined to disprove. You can't make a silk purse out of a sow's ear. Next door, I went to the farm. Can I buy a sow's ear? Got one. Lovely little thing. It's like a human ear a bit hairier and sort of pointed, and rather pinker. It's like the, the, the ear of a, of a huge, rather shy, um, anemic garden gnome. <laughs> and I looked at this and I thought, what I'll do is, I'll cut a, a pocket in it, and then sew a zip on the pocket, and then put some silk inside the pocket, and it'll be a silk purse, you see. A purse for carrying silk, you see. Bit of a cheat, but it works, you know. I have made a silk purse. But you can't cut raw meat, you know, it doesn't cut at all. It, it, it just sort of wobbles with a knife. You know? So I obviously had to cure the ear. Now, it's quite easy to cure uh, meat into leather. All you do is you, you uh, sort of brush it with salt and you leave it out in the hot summer sun for ten days. Which I did, it took four years. <laughs> It was hanging around all the time. I used to hang it out on, on a rake, you know, which I used to call my, rather humorously, my earache. <laughs> <laughs> I do think a joke helps liven up these stories, don't you? Uh, and I used to take it to parties and sort of <laughs> drop it casually on the floor <laughs> and then start back as if in surprise and say, hello, what's this ear? You know? <laughs> great fun in those days and uh, eventually uh, the ear was completely cured and I started to cut into it and of course it was then like leather and you can't sort of cut a pocket in leather at all and uh, so there was no hope of sewing a zip onto it so I thought the only possible way to make, make a silk purse out of it is to sort of peel it as a child peel, peels an orange until one's got a long long thread of it and then weave it into a purse which I proceeded to do. Well, I didn't, actually, because I didn't succeed in doing it, because I, I couldn't get it fine enough to go into the sewing machine needle. <laughs> it came out about the size of a match, the stuff, and kept breaking off and didn't know what to do with it, and suddenly I had an inspiration. My car's got tubeless tyres, and it had a puncture. And, you know, they stuff little things into cars exactly like a piece of dried 
pig's ear the width and length of a matchstick, exactly like that. So I tried that. I put my little bit in and I bashed it with the rest of the ear that I hadn't cut up, and it went in, and that tubeless tyre ran for the rest of its natural life. <laughs> and I discovered it's absolutely marvellous that from my little thing I'd made a complete outfit for repairing tubeless tyres. Isn't that nice? Isn't that nice? Story? <laughs> but it, no, but it didn't pass unnoticed because the local paper wrote it up. They were so staggered by this discovery. And they gave it a very good title, this article, too. They called it Tire Kit from Ear. <laughs> And uh, by your vote, uh, Frank Muir does win the contest of the two stories. But nevertheless, the entire contest is won by the other team, and Scott James and Dennis Norton, by one half of a mark. <laughs> and that brings to an end this edition of My Word. In My Word, you heard Dillis Powell, Anne Scott James, Frank Muir and Dennis Norton, introduced by Jack Longland. The program was devised by Tony Schreien and Edward J. Mason and presented by the BBC. presents My Word. And here to introduce the program and the panel is Jack Longland. My Word is a word game played by people whose business is words. And those taking part are Dillis Powell, Dennis Norton, Anne Scott James, and Frank Muir. Test round one to test their respective vocabularies. Two marks if they get the right answer. Dillis Powell first. What is a pitite? P I T T I T E. Pitite. Somebody who sits in a pit. Where? In a pit. Which kind of pit? Oh, um, um, a theatrical pit. <laughs> That'll do. Two marks it is. Um, pitite is somebody occupying a seat in the pit of the theatre. And it usually is uh, applied to people who are regularly there, regular habitués of the pit. Two marks. Dennis Norton, what is an avadavat? A-V-A-D-A-V-A-T, or if we prefer it, and it helps, an amadavat. Oh, that, that... <laughs> I'd have been in trouble without that one, you know. <laughs> I've copied it down, but I think I've got one vava. Too, <laughs> too many. Mm. Avadavat. Ab 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 is a kind of noise that uh, I once stayed at a hotel in the Midlands that the bed springs made. Ab 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 Terribly humiliating if I said I haven't got the faintest idea. Is it Indian? Is it Indian? Yes. Is it anything to do with a nurse? And yeah. Emma, you sort of gave that very kid that it would help. No, it, it, with it, him. it is Indian. You're quite right. No, um, <laughs> not unless nurses have wings. Oh yes, some <laughs> ornithological nursing mother. <laughs> <laughs> that could be. I would be prepared to call an ornithological nursing mother an abba dabba. Abba dabba, abba dabba. I'll give you give you one out of two <laughs> for knowing it was Indian. Uh, um, Amma or Ava Davat is a small Indian songbird, which I'm reliably informed is brown in colour with white spots. And it's named after the place where it normally frequents, which is Amadabad. And Scott James, what is a Scaldino? S C A L D I N O, Scaldino. Well, it must be Italian. Can yes. I get a mark for that? Yes. And caldo is the Italian for hot. Yes. So it's something of a hot nature. It is. 
I think it's a sort of operatic word. I think it's the man who chases the, all the girls in an opera. <laughs> sort of hot one. <laughs> no, no. He sing, sings Caldino, means he sings like a scalded cat. <laughs> <laughs> well, then it must be something to do with hot water or a hot stove or a barbecue. It's a barbecue. Uh, hot, hot stove is very, very close indeed. You're doing very well. Well, it's a hot Italian, Italian hot stove. Yes, and where do you put it? <laughs> <laughs> No. It's a small heating device used by elderly women in Italy, and it's an earthenware pot with a handle, rather like a basket handle, about eight inches across, and peasant women fill them with hot charcoal, and they tuck them under their voluminous petticoats to keep themselves warm. <laughs> so that though the respectable dictionaries call this a hand or foot warmer, the <laughs> lady who supplied us with this very, very useful information says she prefers to think of them as thigh warmers. <laughs> <laughs> I just think of a few blistered Neapolitan gentlemen's hands. <laughs> <laughs> Mafia <My fear>, to you. <laughs> well, back to Frank Miller. Frank, what is your sense input? S I N C I P U T, Sincipite. My mind's gone blank. <laughs> well, you're very Since he put the question. <laughs> Thank you. Very, very close to the answer. Is there anything to do with oxypod? Yes, the opposite end. Well, it's your feet, then. No, no, sorry, no. The, the opposite part. The oxypod's the back of your head. Yes, well, the opposite part. I was kicked off it. <laughs> Obviously. Um, with the front of your head? Yes. Yes, sir. <laughs> <laughs> One half. I did do some help with that. Uh, Sensi put is the head, if you can think of it this way, which I find rather difficult, from the start of your forehead to the top of the head, whereas occiput is the top of your head to the nape of your neck. So these are the two halves, and it does... The nape you put. <laughs> no, it's a Latin word, and uh, it, it comes from a word meaning just half head, but it happens to be the front half. Before we begin round two, I give each team a quotation for them to write down, and then I hope that the two women members of the team will go on studying the quotations, because at the end, I shall ask them where the quotations come from. And Dillis Powell and Frank Muir, your quotation is, One good turn deserves another. And Anne, with Dennis Norton, yours is, Up, up, my friend, and quit your books. And at the end of the programme, I shall ask Dennis and Frank to give me their idea of how these came to be said or written. Round two is a round of Shavian characters, and I want to know in what play by George Bernard Shaw do the following characters appear. Two marks again. Dennis Powell, Captain Shotover. Heartbreak House. Absolutely splendid. Written in 1917, and Captain Shotover is a splendid character. Two marks. Dennis Norton, a character I'm sure will appeal to you, King Magnus. Yes, that was the king who stood as member of parliament for Windsor. Yes, that's right. Yeah, that's yes. the apple cart. Well done. Two marks it is. <laughs> now, Anne Scott James, Dubedat. D-U-B-E-D-A-T. Dubedat. Oh, is that um, the doctor's dilemma? Yes, two marks it is. <laughs> Dubedat was the, uh, not im, but amoral artist, I suppose you could call him, in The Doctor's Dilemma, which was Shaw's satire on the competence and ethics of the medical profession as it then was. Thank you. Andrew Undershaft. Was, was he not, the father of the girl after whom the play was named? Yes. And the play? Major Barbara. Well done. Two marks. Well done. <laughs> Major Barbara was the play, and Barbara herself was a Salvation Army major, Major Barbara, and Andrew Undershaft was her papa, and he was a kind of armaments tycoon with the right kind of enlightened Shavian views. Well, now we have a round of brief questions on our old pals from Greek mythology. And I want brief answers on one side of the paper only. Uh, Dillis Powell, who was Polyphemus? 
And how did Odysseus and his men escape from Polyphemus? Polyphemus was a giant with one eye who kept um, affectionately a lot of sheep. Yes. And Ulysses and his companions were somehow trapped by this yes. large gentleman. And they escaped by tying themselves under the stomachs of the sheep. And poor old Polyphemus, who only had one eye, never saw them. He yes, got out. Something had happened to his eye by then. Oh, by then, I think they'd, they'd run. They were not very nice to him. They'd run a sort of stake into, his, into the eye that there was. Yes, sir. Yes. And he was so angry that when they got into their ships, he flung a very large rock at them. He did, yeah. Absolutely. Right. Right. <laughs> <laughs> two, two marks to this. Hold on. <laughs> Dennis Norton, we know the expression assault to Cerberus and what it means, but what was the first original <laughs> sop to Cerberus? Well, it means, it, 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 for Frank's benefit, this is not to, to delay matters slightly what I, I think. <laughs> sop to Cerberus is like is when you give a traffic warden a boiled sweet. Yeah. <laughs> Poison. <laughs> Cerberus was a dog, wasn't he? A kind of dog, yes. It's not the salt, is it? No, that's not. Um, <laughs> he was dark, and he was something to do with when you died. He was something to do with ferrying you over the river. He was either the, the ferry keeper's dog or something, and you, you, you dropped him something <laughs> in order to... Uh, bung him. You bung, <laughs> bunged him something in order to <laughs> carry favour. Um, yes, which side of the river sticks? Which side? You mean yes. our side or... Our the... side or theirs. Oh. It must have been, um, who went down there? Yes. No, Virgil you're getting, went you're getting down. There. Yes. Aeneas went down, That's didn't it. he? You're there. And he threw him the doped, um, sock yes. to put him to sleep sock. so that he could go across That's it. That's right. to see the shade. That's right. Two marks it is. You've got it absolutely right. Cerberus was a not very nice three-headed dog with hair like of snakes who guarded the entrance to Hades or hell mm -hmm. And as um, Anne quite rightly says, uh, the Trojan Aeneas was taken by the Sibyl to this underworld. And the only way of getting past the gatekeeper, this three-headed dog, was uh, a drugged cake, which the dog greedily lapped up. And he went to sleep and they got in. Uh, Anne Scott James, we know that Scylla and Charybdis were two horrors to be avoided by the Greek mariners of old. But what precisely were they? Well, Charybdis was a whirlpool. Yes. And um, Scylla? Scylla was a monster which had a lot of heads on a lot of necks. Mm. How many? Six, I yes, think. Yes, quite right. It was a six-headed monster, and it used to sort of, on very long necks, mm. its heads would come out and snatch sailors from the ships that passed by. Well done. Absolutely accurate and well done. Do more. Scylla had six inconveniently long necks and six absolutely horrible heads, and they seized and devoured the sailors, who, if they were rash enough to stand on deck as they sailed past her cave where she lived. Charybdis was a highly dangerous whirlpool off the coast of Sicily, and possibly all this happened in the Straits of Messina, as they're now called. Frank, now, what were the Pythian Games? P Y T H I A N, Pythian oh, Games. Yeah. Sack race and the <laughs> egg and spoon. And... <laughs> there. Think. Oh, <coughs> think. we think um, drawing a bow at a venture. <laughs> they happened at Delphi. They did. Yes, or just below. Mm. Yes, quite right. And what? <laughs> what was sacred? No, they're, they're, they're sacred. Yes, they are. Sacred they're, games. They're, they're sacred indeed. Yeah. In Delphi, just below Delphi. Yes, and the garden. On the bottom of the hill, where the, <laughs> That's the right. valley. Where was that? Yeah. To Apollo. Um, to Apollo. Mm. To Apollo. Yes. To Apollo. I think that'll do. Cool. <laughs> Too much. <laughs> Jack, don't hesitate. <laughs> <laughs> now, this time I won't. Uh, Pythian games uh, originated uh, because Apollo, the god, uh, killed a serpent who was called not Python, but Python, who rose out of the mud left after the great flood, the flood of Deucalion in this case, but Noah in a different uh, legend. And the Python lived in caves on Mount Parnassus around Delphi, Delphi, and was killed by Apollo, who 
in order to celebrate his victory, established these games, which were next in importance, the Olympic Games, and rather like our Commonwealth Games, they came in sort of intermediate years between the actual Olympiad. And now we come to the last round and go back to those quotations I gave the teams earlier in the program. For two marks, and Scott James, can you give me the origin of the quotation, up, up, my friend, and quit your books? I think it was by William Wordsworth. Yes, that's good enough. Up, up, my friend, and quit your books, or surely you'll grow double. <coughs> up, up, my friend, and clear your looks. Why all this toil and trouble? Wordsworth in a poem called The Tables Turned. It goes on with the theme, Let Nature Be Your Teacher. Now, Dennis Powell, the origin of yours, please. One good turn deserves another. It's a proverb. Mm-hmm. Legend again. It comes out of Aesop, I think, had it once, didn't it? Did Aesop have That's it? That's a jolly good shot. I don't remember it. But, uh, oh, you, I'm you, sure I, Aesop had it, yes. You, yes, you, yes. May, you may well be right. Aesop. Mm. Aesop. <laughs> <laughs> uh, two marks, right. It is a proverb. I think it first occurs, as far as I know, in a Latin manuscript in the John Ryland's library, and then it's in John Haywood's uh, celebrated collection of proverbs in 1550, One good turn asketh another. Well, now I'm going to ask Frank and Dennis to give me their explanations of how these quotations came into being. And for this round, the marks will go to whichever incredible explanation receives the longer applause from the audience here in the theatre. So, back to Dennis Norton and his quotation. Up, up, my friend, and quit your books. If I ever get asked, what was your most memorable Christmas? I have an answer. It was last Christmas. <laughs> What it all gets down to is this complicated business of the Christmas presents which Frank and I give to each other to make sure that I spend exactly the same amount on the present that I give to him as he spends on the present that he gives to me. And I can't go out and buy the present I give to him until I've received the present that he gives to me and can therefore calculate that price. Now, last year, it was a beautiful suitcase, fully packed with tropical clothes. <laughs> See, with Frank, it's not the gift, it's the thought <laughs> behind it. So immediately, I went to my catalogues and priced it. £37.10 that boy had spent. Well, I knew what to spend, but now there was a snag. It was six o'clock Christmas Eve, and the shops were shut. What could I give him? Well, I didn't like to give him money because he's not used to it. <laughs> <coughs> and then I suddenly remembered cigarette coupons. I have a lot, I, I save cigarette coupons. Now, Pricing cigarette coupons as being worth roughly a penny each, I worked out I could give him 9,000 cigarette coupons in return. And I looked up the catalogue that the cigarette people get, and some beautiful things you can get with 9,000 cigarette coupons. There was an, um, an ant colony. Um, there was a wrought iron fire escape. The things that, you know, a boy can really play with. So... Then another snag. It was now about seven, and the post office was shut. But with me, as soon as the snag arises, there's always a brainwave to solve it. I thought, well, I, instead of making a parcel, I'll put them in letters and post them to him, you see. Well, I then took the envelopes to the letterbox on the corner. It was now about half past 11 on Christmas Eve. And I started popping them through. Now, the trouble is, the letterbox was almost full. You know, there are an awful lot of irresponsible, faultless people who leave <laughs> their postal of Christmas gifts at the very last minute. And I was left with one holding 50 that I just couldn't get through. So what I did, I just pushed it into the slot, which was bung up. Then I stepped back a pace, and I'm fairly tall, raised a leg and pushed it. Now, it was in that position 
that I stood for the next 18 hours. <laughs> it's very difficult to get your foot out of a letterbox once you get it in. Now, I'm not going to dwell on the details of that day, the passers-by who paused and snickered, <laughs> the others who went on, came back with cameras. <laughs> Not even that rotten little fox terrier who... <laughs> All I will mention is this, <clears throat> that at 4.30, just as it was beginning to snow, who should stroll by but Frank? Now, you're in a peculiarly vulnerable position, standing with one leg stuck upwards through a letterbox particularly when you're facing somebody who has not received the Christmas present that he had calculated down to the last penny. But I will say this for Frank. His behavior was absolutely wonderful. He pulled the other leg away. <laughs> not a, a word about his Christmas present. All I heard from him as he bent down to grasp my ankle was just an echo of Wordsworth. Up, up, my friend, and quit your box. go back to Frank Muir, his quotation was, one good turn deserves another. <clears throat> it's request night tonight, so hands up those who'd like to hear how to build a low curved brick wall. <laughs> now, to build a brick wall, you need bricks, uh, you need mortar, which is made of cement, sand, you need water, you need gum boots, you need uh, gloves, piece of string, you need a spade, a bucket, and a doctor. <laughs> first, first of all, you, you mark out your curve in front of the front door. Then you come to the next process, which is mixing the mortar. For this, you just um, you get a sack of cement, an uh, ordinary hundredweight brown paper sack of cement, and you lift that up and you take it. Well, that's where you need the doctor. <laughs> but nowadays... Um, Keyhole surgery, you know. Hernia's nothing to worry about. <laughs> a fortnight and you're absolutely as good as new. You now have your cement mixed and you're prepared to lay your bricks. I bought a book on this, which I don't recommend. It was called um, Learn to Lay Bricks. When you think... It could well have been written by a chicken. When you think of it... <laughs> somebody... Books should be written by authors. A man who knows how to lay bricks is a bricklayer. And he doesn't know how to write books. It took me 20 minutes to master how to pick the brick up. <laughs> Each of the faces... Anyway, you hold the brick in your left hand and you weigh it and you feel it. It said, savour your brick. <laughs> and you toss it up and down your hand a couple of times and all the skin comes off the end of your finger. <laughs> You then pick up a trowel of the cement and you fling it lightly onto the brick. You then find that your wristwatch strap is covered in cement <laughs> and there's none on the brick. <laughs> so you, you then drop the trowel and pick up a handful of cement and press it firmly along the top of the brick. You then turn the brick over and the cement falls off it. <laughs> Whatever you do, when you put the cement on, you have to turn it and it falls off again. <laughs> Eventually, well, it, the, the thing to do is to drop the brick entirely, use both hands on the... Get on your knees, you see. <laughs> get down to the pile of cement. Get a couple of handfuls of it and just sort of slosh it down on the ground and then slap the brick onto it, you see. 
Then when you come to the second course, you also do the same. Otherwise, you, you, it just falls off and goes in your gum boot. Instead, you can't get the gum boot off at nine <laughs> but, because the, the cement's hardened. Then when you've, uh, when you've finished your three courses of bricks, you then stand there and lean against it and it falls over. <laughs> <laughs> That's all I've got time for this week. Well, there's one, one thing I omitted to tell you, is that um, when, um, when I was building this wall, I, I always hum when I'm working, you know. And make up little snatches of melody, you know. I never do anything with these. I never uh, give them to anybody or sell them. <laughs> so, well, but when I was making that curved wall, you see, what being stuck in this gumboot for a fortnight and, and whatnot, I, I made up a whole complete melody, and it's so good, you know, a whole tune that I'm going to send it to um, all the way to Hollywood, to Las Vegas. <laughs> because little melodies, you know, you make up and you build a curved brick wall are not worth bothering about. But I think, you know, I agree with the old saying that um, one good tune deserves Sinatra. <laughs> By your vote and very narrow margin, the contest of the two stories is won by Dennis Norton, but nevertheless, Dillis Powell and Frank Muir win the entire contest, and that brings to an end this edition of My Word. In My Word, you heard Dillis Powell, Anne Scott James, Frank Muir, and Dennis Norton, introduced by Jack Longland. The program was devised by Tony Shryan and Edward J. Mason and presented by the BBC. You've been listening to My Word from the BBC, heard each week at this time. This is the WFMT Fine Arts Network. Thank you.